So Utah has some incredible national parks with some amazing scenery in it. And on this trip, I'll be visiting, um, oh yeah, none of them. Now Utah's national parks obviously are amazing. They're some of the most incredible places, incredible scenery, I think in the entire country can be found in Utah's national parks. And I will go there one day. One day I will visit many of them. On this trip, however, I'm going to focus on some of the really cool stuff you can find freely on BLM land. And I think it's going to be awesome enough as it is. Yesterday, I drove from Eugene, Oregon to Nampa, Idaho, and I've spent most of today on the highway getting down into central Utah, where I was welcomed with a bit of wind. driving all day and have an area planned not too far off the highway to make camp sooner than later. I know there are some rock formations and hopefully I can find a little shelter from this wind. Unfortunately, my planned camping area is also very sandy, and in this dust storm, I can't see well enough to navigate across the open dunes to where there might be some rocky coves. This wind is so intense that I suspect the blowing sand is just going to swirl around in those rocks, and I very quickly decided to simply bypass this area entirely and proceed further along what was supposed to be tomorrow morning's route, in hopes of stumbling across a more protected spot to spend the night. I am a little disheartened that things have already gone awry so quickly. If you've followed my channel for the past few years, you'll recall that something always seems to go wrong on the first day of my week-long expeditions. As I push through this relentless wind, it occurs to me that, once again, day one has gone wrong. At this point, however, I have no idea how much worse it's about to get. I found a promising campsite tucked into some rocks, but the wind is still overpowering and blowing dust and grit around in here, so I'm going to push on. Chasing the sun here, um, trying to get to what was going to be my night two campsite, maybe. I don't really have a good sense of scale and I don't really know if it's even possible for me to get there. Through the haze of dust in the air, I'm still enjoying the red rock formations rising out of the desert's pink sands. I am at first bewildered when the road just ends at this flat expanse of bedrock, but then I realize the map shows the road continuing right across there, and sure enough, it picks right back up on the other side. Once again, I am momentarily disoriented by the lack of a defined road, but I've spotted some rock cairns guiding the way. Between the cairns and the map I'm following in Gaia GPS, I'm managing to stay on track. Driving across these rock surfaces is actually kind of fun now that I'm starting to wrap my head around how to navigate them. This is starting to get trickier as it gets darker, but I'm now seeing paint marks in addition to the cairns, which are helping me find my way. At this point, I'm just trying to get to a campsite I spotted in satellite imagery, which looks like it could be protected from the wind by an immense rock formation looming over the landscape, and it's just a little bit further.
All right, so here's the situation. I finally just had to give up. I found a flat spot and just stopped. And I can see where I think the trail is supposed to go, but it's just in the dark. It's just too hard to see. I'm having to stop and get out and look. And it's, it's, it's dumb for me to keep going at this point. I was trying to get to a spot just right over there next to that great big gigantic rock formation where it looked like there was a spot that I might have been able to get out of the wind. Instead I am I am full in the wind and it is rocking the truck and uh, so it's going to be an interesting night in the dark on this gnarly little trail that ended up getting way more technical than I expected. Um, I slid a little bit sideways as I was going around a corner, sort of a steep, slightly off-camber corner, uh, into a tree in a way that I didn't realize. Um, I not only scratched the truck, I um, dented up the, the fender as well. I didn't set anything up. There's no way I can I can cook out there. Um, I have a little mini stove that I can cook with in, inside, but I think I'm just going to cut up some salami, some crackers. I've got a tangerine and uh, call it good for tonight. And Maybe, hopefully, that wind will die down by morning. <laughs> I sure do appreciate uh, the work that I put into making this build happen now. I am so glad I'm not in a tent. Just enjoying this incredible scenery I woke up to. Just gorgeous. And trying not to think about this. In the light of day, I've discovered that the damage is far more extensive than I could see in the dark. The rear door is pretty banged up in addition to the rear quarter panel. When this happened last night, I thought I was just hearing some branches, as I often do on narrow Pacific Northwest forest trails. I still don't even understand exactly what happened, but suddenly the pinstriping that had been accumulating on the truck seems so insignificant. The wind died down in the wee hours of the morning, and uh, it was relatively calm, you know, for the first hour or so after sunrise. So I got to get out and enjoy being outdoors a little bit. I was even able to set up my kitchen, make coffee, make breakfast, so that was great. The wind has since picked up. It even knocked my stove right off my table. So it looks like the wind is going to continue to be an issue. And in the light of day, I also hiked up the continuation of the trail, which was much, much easier to see in the daylight. There is a passage right up through here. And now looking up there, I see a cairn. And I see another cairn. So I think I'll be able to continue on the route that I was planning to take and not have to double back the way I came.
So what I'm doing this morning is I'm actually gonna drive out to the campsite. I was kind of maybe trying to get to last night. It's 9.30 in the morning. I am not going to go and camp out here, but I want to check it out and uh, see if I was right that it looked like a cool spot to camp with I think gonna be an interesting view. The diversity of scenery just within my first 16 hours off pavement is astonishing. The landscape can go from a pink sandy desert to red rock to white rock to red dirt meadows within surprisingly short distances. There's no way the camera is doing justice to the scale of this little canyon. That's an immense and extremely sheer cliff over there. And down along there you can just see uh, there's actually a road. So if you can imagine the width of a road and a vehicle going along it, that's how far down that is. That's actually a pretty big river. It is just incredible vistas. Every place I look, every place I go. So that did turn out to be a pretty cool spot. Uh, it's very early in the day, obviously I'm not gonna camp there. And as far as campsites go, I mean, it's really cool, but from where you actually are in camp, like where you'd be cooking and, you know, doing stuff around camp, you can't see down into the canyon. You just, I mean, you can see a little bit of those walls. And it was very scenic, very interesting there, but ultimately it's, uh, it's okay that I'm not gonna camp there. I'm happy that that I was right that this was a pretty cool little spot out here, this little sort of peninsula of land out into that sort of U-shaped bend in the river. This entire area was submerged under a vast sea many eons ago and you can really see where that water level was by those erosion marks high up on this rock formation. Down a side road, I've caught a glimpse of an old windmill, a Depression-era CCC project built in 1937 to provide water for rangeland cattle. It's no longer connected to a well, but the pumping mechanism continues to operate with the wind, which 
definitely does not seem to be in short supply out here. This is just this cool little box canyon that I spotted in satellite imagery where the rocks were all just sort of rounded and bulbous and uh, it just it's a little dead-end road that goes up in here and uh, I thought it could possibly be an interesting place to camp but there was a sign coming in here that said no camping. Once again enchanted by the vivid colors and surreal undulating forms, and while this canyon isn't terribly deep, it's far more impressive than I had imagined just from looking at Google Earth. So far, my first 24 hours roaming around out here in central Utah has wildly exceeded my expectations, and I find myself driving along with a smile on my face more often than not. Despite last night's mishaps, I'm so happy to be out here in this captivatingly unique and beautiful scenery. It's time to hop on the nearest highway and head towards a new area to explore. On this next segment of my journey, I'm hoping to see not only more of Utah's striking and unique geology, but also pursue a bit of the history to be found out here. I think the loop I have planned for the next 24 hours will provide some of both. I spotted this cabin when I was researching the trip and wasn't too sure just what I'd find, but this hundred-year-old log structure is wonderfully well preserved. In the wet Pacific Northwest forests, this would have long ago disappeared into the undergrowth and rotted away. Finds like this are definitely a perk of exploring the more arid areas of the western U.S. As I proceed towards my next potential point of interest, this rugged, rocky landscape evokes a prehistoric vibe, like a dinosaur should be tromping across that dirt and sagebrush. sort of some 
features here, but I had no idea it was going to be this massive. <laughs> Who needs a national park? turned off onto a side road, a dead-end spur heading up into these cliffs, where I think I might find some historical artifacts. I had seen on satellite imagery it looked like there were some, maybe some little bits of ruins of some kind of a mining operation. And uh, yeah, there are in fact a, a few cabins here. And I don't know if this is some kind of storage or shaft or maybe just this little storage thing. This abandoned uranium mining site isn't that old, dating to the mid-20th century when demand for radioactive material was high for the production of nuclear weapons. An additional surge of demand occurred in the 60s and 70s as nuclear reactors were developed for power generation, but Utah's uranium heydays are long over, and while there still exist active claims covering many of these sites, no actual mining has occurred for decades. It's time to find a campsite of my own, and not far down the road, another spur trail up into the cliffs looks intriguing. I hadn't spotted this site in my research and planning back home, but there are definitely remnants of a mining operation here as well. While no buildings are still standing at this mine, what remains continues to provide shelter for local inhabitants. In the light of day, many artifacts dating back probably 50 to 70 years are to be found strewn about the area. This site even has its own abandoned vehicle. There's a road cut that ramps up to this structure, so I'm assuming that was some sort of loading dock. It's definitely not a mine shaft entrance. Yeah, I'm really glad I decided to come and do non-national park stuff because if this is what it's like not in the national parks, I can't even begin to imagine how mind-blowingly awesome it must be in the national parks. Already, you know, and I'm not even two days into it here, everything has far exceeded my expectations. It's all much more big and grandiose and monumental than I imagined it would be. So 
I had read a comment about this area that said um, it's not a national park, but it should be, or something like that. It's astonishing, these soaring cliffs on one side, and now this just incredible gnarly canyon on the other side. It is just spectacular. abandoned vehicle. There must be another uranium mine nearby. I feel like I've already seen a hundred different varieties of rock formations, but these bizarre columns with such distinct layers are something new yet again, and so striking. I can't believe how perfect and tidy those stripes are, representing what must be millions of years of sedimentary deposits on the bottom of what was once a vast sea. Apparently one of the miners out here appreciated this view as much as I do. I guess it's not too surprising to find some of these cabins still standing, though as the wind gusts and subsides, it becomes clear that this one will certainly come down one day. Between the car and the cabin, there must be another mining site somewhere up this trail. Soon enough, I'm seeing more signs of human activity out here. And then, there it is, bored into the base of this immense butte. Even without the mine artifacts, the scenery here does not disappoint, complete with a pretty impressive arch up in a nearby cliff face. <laughs> How is that even possible? It's just too much awesome, it's too much. For every little clip of scenery that you're seeing, there's at least 10 scenes that go by that I just, I don't, I, that I don't film. I can't film at all. It's non-stop 
incredible scenery. Around every bend unleashes something else. The density of awesome is unlike anything I've experienced. I'm just blown away. That is how I thought I was getting to my next point of interest, but it appears to be for ATVs only and a rough trail to boot. Well, I'm not thrilled about the backtracking, but I have to admit this was a beautiful drive, this part that I have to go back through. Um, was really just some incredible scenery and uh, I wouldn't have seen it if I had just been on the correct road. So I guess that's what I'm here to do is to see stuff. And, that's all right, that was a really just unbelievably scenic little out and back. I think I'm gonna be fine on gas. lot of miles looping well out of my way, I'm finally coming up on one last bit of history to take in before starting to look for camp. And this one is a lot older than the uranium mines, and a lot older even than that cowboy cabin we saw at the beginning of this video. These pictographs date back thousands of years. Now I've seen some super primitive pictographs in Oregon, but these beautiful designs are on a whole other level. Out in the middle of nowhere, Utah, there lurks an immense population of goblins, hidden in their own private valley, and you can walk among them. It's well worth the $20 per vehicle entry fee for the privilege of wandering freely among the countless hoodoos. Eons of erosion have carved these unusual bulbous shapes out of sandstone which had formed 170 million years ago from deposits in what was once a tidal flat bordering an ancient sea. Goblin Valley State Park is entirely accessible to passenger cars via paved roads, about a 30-minute drive from the tiny town of Hanksville. I'm on a week-long backcountry overland adventure, so I got here via dirt roads in my four-wheel drive truck. I particularly enjoyed the drive through this narrow little canyon on my way to get here. I stumbled onto this campsite and thought it might be a good spot to come back to after visiting Goblin Valley, but the wind is just funneling through this canyon. I do really like the view it offers of this crazy balanced rock. I would not stand too close to that on a gusty day like today, or really ever. It's late afternoon in May and my plan was to spend the last few hours of daylight exploring Goblin Valley. The spring winds have been relentless all week. And today, they've blown some kind of weather system in, so the light is not very appealing, and even though it's a Tuesday, there are a lot of people, sometimes noisy people, strolling around the goblins. But turns out the entry fee is good for two days, so I've decided to find some place to camp, so I can come spend a couple hours here early in the morning. There is a campground within the park itself, but reservations are recommended. Even on a Tuesday, there is no vacancy. Fortunately, the park is surrounded by BLM land and there are dispersed camping options not far away. 
This nearby butte appears to be situated perfectly to block the gusting wind, and while there are numerous other people camped up in the contours of the cliff, I eventually find my own little cove to tuck up into. Well, that was another long day, but uh, this is the earliest I have found a campsite uh, of the entire trip so far. And I just love this campsite. I've got my own personal goblins to camp with me tonight. I've also got my own personal slot canyons, two of them. One is really nothing. This one actually winds quite a ways up into the hill. I really thought this was gonna be a dead end as soon as I got around that first corner, but it just keeps going and going. This is so cool. I got up extra early this morning and it's time to head back over to the state park. My neighbors are still in their camps and are definitely going to miss the sunrise. Spending the night and coming back in the morning has proven to be the right call. The clouds are breaking up. The daily winds haven't yet started to gust, and I've got the entire park to myself. The valley of goblins below me is still sunk into shadow, so let's get down there and watch the sunrise again. There are a number of dedicated hiking trails leading to specific points of interest in the park, but the main appeal here, at least for me, is the choose-your-own-adventure aspect of this little valley, where there are no defined paths to follow, and you can wander and explore at will. The brochure for the park does say that you're welcome to climb up on top of the hoodoos. Uh, they only ask that you stay off the ones that, you know, look a little more fragile or unbalanced or ready to fall over. For an additional $10 fee, the visitor center will issue you a permit to fly a drone in the park. Another advantage of arriving at dawn before anyone else is that I don't have to worry about disturbing other visitors with my drone. Even though I was permitted to do so, I would not have wanted to make that annoying noise with people around.
Well, that was 100% worth spending the night nearby, coming back first thing in the morning. No wind, almost no clouds. The sun came out from behind the clouds. Just a gorgeous, gorgeous morning. Now I'm on the road, it's only eight o'clock, and I can take my time working my way towards uh, my next destination. almost missed this hidden in a grove of trees and scrub. I hadn't spotted this old homestead when I was scouring satellite imagery planning this trip. This whole site is pretty nicely preserved. In addition to the main home, there are still corrals and animal shelters standing out here. incredible how there's always just more and more different types of formations, different colors of soil. Now I've got some like yellows and grays. Vista to see is unreal. It was a little difficult to enjoy getting hit with what feels like 50, 60 mile an hour gusts of wind pushing you in the direction of the thousand foot cliff you're trying not to fall off of. And getting hit in the face with not just like sand and dust but actual little bits of rock. <laughs> Crazy wind. We're coming up on where I plan to spend the rest of the day exploring. This is an open roadless area where cross-country travel is permitted, but very different from the roadless plies I've driven in the past. Even though there are no official roads and you're free to drive anywhere, you can see that trails tend to develop. It's 
seemed intriguing to be able to just point the truck in any direction and drive, but this soft sloped soil is carved by deep and often impassable drainage ruts that are dangerously difficult to see until you're right on top of them. I know there are more compelling contours to be found out here, so I'm going to push up into a different area. I have to keep reminding myself that these are not roads, but simply the pathway multiple other people have driven. It seems like the safest approach, but they can get really off camber and you're blind to sometimes really steep drop-offs. I decided to try again striking out across the terrain on my own, but this seemingly tame looking hill got uncomfortably steep and narrow and I can't see what happens over the top. I'm just on one of the established trails. You can see how it'd be really easy to get yourself stuck in some little gully and just wedge yourself in. I'm gonna be able to drive out of this, but um, this, is, this is not the place for an overland vehicle. Definitely not the place to be out by yourself. I had wanted to camp around here tonight and get footage of this massive, unusual butte at sunset and sunrise, but I'm honestly just not really enjoying driving out here, and the wind is the worst I've experienced all week. I'm going to again change up my itinerary and just move on immediately towards the area I had originally planned to explore and camp tomorrow. It's really a striking landscape out here, but seems that it's better explored via motorcycle or side-by-side. So I'm trying to get to a spot I think that's going to get me closer to this canyon. Even this drive through the somewhat featureless desert out here is really nice. I'm enjoying this view of these massive, massive mountains in front of me. And I mean, I'm almost at 5,000 feet, so I can't even imagine what elevation those mountains get up to. And the desert itself, the colors are just vivid. It's orange, it's red. What green there is in the sagebrush here, it just pops against the pinky, orangey, red sands. And this desert really is sandy. It blows into drifts that pile up on the road like mini dunes. I'm gonna keep pushing on to the spot that I had in mind and uh, we'll see what it looks like. If it's not as epic, I could always come back here because that view is just stunning.
All right, so here's this sweet little campsite. The wind is coming from that direction, and there's this rock wall up here. I think you could probably just get right up in here. There's a little fire ring right there. Not that I'll be having a fire tonight. Now the canyon <laughs> is up over this rim, so I've got no view for the rest of the day but I have a lot less wind. Well, I'm here to see this state, not hide from it. It would be a shame to let this incredible vista sit there unwatched. Like it if the wind was not blowing so hard? Yes, I would. Am I totally bummed out? No. I've got a beautiful view of the canyon. I've got a very comfortable place to sit here and enjoy it. And while I can't set up my stove and the table and all of that to cook, I'm just going to snack on some stuff. found myself with an entire unplanned day before I meet up with locals Jared and Mike tomorrow morning. So today I'm just going to explore and hopefully find a campsite for tonight that is sheltered from these unrelenting winds. Well I've only just left camp and I'm on sort of a high point and I can see over there sort of on the other side of the valley, if you can call this a valley, some like cliffs and formations and stuff. I think I can see what that is on Gaia GPS and it looks like there's some interesting contours. The wind has been coming from this way and it looks like there's cliffs that may block that wind. So I'll go poke around in there, it's not very far away. Most of the Utah desert is public land, so it was not at all difficult to find a road heading through the area I spotted. Unfortunately, there are no spur trails that go up to the base of these cliffs. No campsite here, so I'm just going to keep going and see where this road takes me. Well, I didn't really come out here to do mountain stuff, but man, it's pretty intriguing. I don't want to camp up at any higher elevation than Marty Ack, it got pretty cold last night. Maybe we can explore a bit.
Is that a hubcap? That's where the valve stem would go. That has got to be some old hubcap. All right. It's part of the history. It stays there. I don't really have any sort of like destination, goal, plan, or anything. I just found this road up into the mountains and I'm just driving up it to see where it goes. I see on the map it is going to come to some sort of a pass, so I'll at least get up to that and maybe there'll be a view. This is really, really lovely as I got down into this little valley here and there's these, uh, I guess they're aspen. Uh, really pretty white bark and they're just starting to leaf out. Uh, we're up at 7,600 feet already. So I don't know that I would camp up in here, although man, it sure is gorgeous. So it looks like there's this little trail up to the top of this little bump here. Uh, doesn't look like too long of a walk. I live at just barely over sea level and even when I'm up at 4,000 feet, I can feel the lack of oxygen. So at 9,000 feet, I'm definitely not good for a lot of hiking and climbing. I just want to get up here and see if I can see what's on the other side of the pass. Oh. Oh, what? Look at how red it is. Oh my gosh, it's so red. And look at these beautiful little alpine sort of meadows still some snow on that road there it is cold up here the truck thermometer said 57 degrees so that's quite a bit colder than it has been down at you know 4,000 feet I'm headed back down the mountain the way I came because I don't want to get too far away from where I'm meeting the back road exploration crew tomorrow morning. As I cooked a pretty solid breakfast this morning, I wasn't really hungry for lunch, but I'm taking a little break in a completely empty campground I found alongside this creek that I keep crossing. seen a soul since getting off the highway. That first trail up along the flank of the mountain and then this road going up into the mountains. Nobody, just nobody. It's nice. I have 
found a campsite for tonight. I am partway up into the mountains here. I can also look off and see a bunch of the places that I've been all week long. Nice fire pit. And I love these little trees. They're like barely taller than me. They actually remind me of the hoodoos at Goblin Valley. It's like these little dwarfed goblin trees. The best thing is there's no wind, almost no wind. Gentle little breeze now and then, sometimes nothing at all. Every place else out there by this time of day, that would have been just gusting, sometimes 50, 60 mile an hour gusts. So this is just great. I've just been going really hard nonstop all week. I'm happy to pause and have sort of a restful afternoon and evening and uh, sort of re-energize and before heading out with uh, Jared and Mike for the next couple of days starting tomorrow morning. As it's looking to be a chilly night and there's no wind to speak of, I'm prepping firewood for what will be the first campfire of the entire trip. Oh my gosh, this is amazing. Just like everything in Utah, this has turned out way better than I expected. Mm. When I planned this trip, I had no intention of visiting any mountains or forests or anything like that. But I am really glad I came up here. While trip planning is really important and this week would not have been as amazing as it was without all of the planning and research that I did at home for weeks leading up to this trip. Being willing to let go of plans and just say, hey, that looks cool, let's go check it out. That's also a really important part of getting out here and doing this because you make some amazing discoveries you never expected and it is it's almost more of a pleasure when you get surprises like this well, it looks like I just rolled up on a couple of rigs that I recognize I'm meeting up with Jared and his brother Mike Jared has a YouTube channel called Backroad Exploration which Mike often assists with I've been watching Jared's channel from my earliest days on YouTube, and I'm excited to finally meet up and roll with these guys. I've decided not to release an individual episode about this segment of my trip, leaving Jared to cover it on his channel. It's definitely kind of nice to sit back and watch someone other than me doing this. I am capturing some footage from my perspective, which I'll turn over to Jared to use in his episodes. I have found some incredible places in Utah on my own, but it's fantastic to be guided by locals, driving this route I would have otherwise missed.
unbelievable scenery. I just did not visualize this at all. Jared had seen some potentially troubling depth forecasts for this crossing, so we're going to pause and take a closer look. That's a gnarly rock right there, though. Yeah, you can't see the obstacles, can you? We might have to go wide a bit. Not deep, so that's good. I guess we can see what it looks like when your Jeep goes through. Ultimately, the crossing was a breeze, and we were able to continue along through the canyon. All day long, I've just been blown away by the perfection of this southwest scenery. Just when I think it can't get any more impressive, Jared and Mike lead me up the craziest switchbacks I've ever seen, ascending the nearly vertical walls of the canyon. someone looked at this cliff and thought, yeah, let's build a road climbing up that. I've driven some heart-stopping shelf roads, but this, with a sheer rock wall on one side and a sheer cliff dropping off the other side, this is unlike anything I've ever experienced. Ha <laughs> ha. 
thing we just climbed up. Oh my gosh. After finishing the climb out of the canyon, we're exploring the grasslands above in search of a place to camp. Wild burrows wander and graze, perhaps not as stately as the wild horses I've seen elsewhere, but absolutely charming nonetheless. push on into dark to eventually find a spot to spend the night. Yeah, but I can, I can get on the here, sure. After breaking camp this morning, we are soon hiking out across slick rock and sand against a backdrop of stunning canyon views, bringing us to a striking set of arches. When it comes to geological oddities, Utah does not disappoint. We've now set out across the desert to complete our two-day loop back to the highway, with one last river to cross. This entire week in Utah has just simply exceeded my expectations in every possible way. Everything was bigger, more beautiful, more interesting than I even imagined it would be. It is now time to air up and head home.